Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree that this is not just a war about rockets from both sides, but it is actually a war about illegal settlements and stolen lands? And what is the next big political move? I have sat here these last 30 years and heard the same statement every year for 30 years, and nothing has happened. Hoffman. Is the right honourable gentleman aware that among the 173 innocent civilians slaughtered by the Israelis in Gaza <coughs> was the inhabitant of a disabled people's home which was hit by Israeli targets and that a, a hospital was hit as well? That whatever one says in deploring the role of Hamas, and I have told the Hamas Prime Minister to his face that I deplore what they do. Nevertheless, if this goes on, we shall have yet another cycle, the third so far. There will be a fourth. It will go on. And unless the Israelis are willing to make peace, the day will come when the Palestinians will explode in anger and despair. Oh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The whole House condemns the killing of those three Israelis and the burning of the Palestinian, and none of us have any truck with Hamas. But is it not clear that for all the vacuous words of the Israeli government and the IDF spokesman, that they have no regard themselves for international humanitarian law, that they place a completely different and much lower value on Palestinian life compared to Israeli life, and that this cycle will go on as long as the international community in an effort to be even-handed, fails to say to the Israelis that the actions that they are taking are completely out with the United Nations Charter and any idea of how a civilised nation ought to behave. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Bradshaw and Secretary Kerry and his own Middle East minister have clearly said that it was the Netanyahu regime's relentless expansion of illegal settlements that bore prime responsibility for the collapse of the Kerry talks. When, rather than this routine language of condemnation on the settlements, can we instead have some real and meaningful action? Mr Martin Horwood. The uh, uh, Foreign Secretary is absolutely right to call for a permanent end to these intolerable rocket attacks on Israel, but right too that too many civilian and children, uh, too, many, uh, too many Palestinian civilians and children are dying. Will he consider whether or not the favourable economic and political relationship with Israel and the, between Israel and the European Union should now be reconsidered in the light of the Israeli government's disproportionate response yeah, to these attacks? Yeah. Burden. She is, of course, correct that the escalation, this latest escalation of tit for tat rockets and military strikes brings peace no closer. It just brings death and destruction. You may be aware that I, with honourable, honourable members, was in Gaza just weeks after the 08 09 Operation Cast Lead and saw for ourselves that humanitarian centres by the UN had been hit by Israeli strikes. As he said, 17,000 Palestinian civilians are now sheltering at UN centres, and the UN reports 49 of those already being damaged. As a high contracting party to the Geneva Convention, what can Britain do about this? Will he confirm that hitting humanitarian centres is a war crime? Kanara Ali. Speaker, in 2010, our Prime Minister described Gaza as being like an open-air prison with its people living under constant attacks and pressure. The latest escalation of the, of the violence and killings has made matters unbearable. When will our government, working with the international community, actually apply pressure on the Israeli government to uh, adhere to international law and humanitarian yeah, yeah. Uh, um, requirements? Because this is just completely unacceptable. The greatest threat to Hamas and the greatest hope for peace is a sustainable future for Gaza and the eradication of poverty. Does the Secretary of State agree that while the Israeli blockade continues, mm. peace cannot be achieved? Ben. Mr Speaker, the tragedy of the loss of life in the whole region surely stems ultimately from the occupation of the West Bank, the settlement policy and the siege of Gaza that's going on at the present time. What practical steps has he taken 
to criticise Israel for its collective punishment of the people of Gaza, destruction of water supplies and sewage plants, killing of large numbers of civilians. What sanctions does he now propose to take against Israel for acting against international law in punishing a civilian population? Emphasis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend has quite rightly said that the only foundation for lasting peace and a safe and secure Israel must be a viable and a contiguous Palestinian state. Uh, would he therefore agree that there can be no peace until there is an end to the blockade of Gaza for even the most basic economic materials like building materials and a withdrawal of the, um, from the illegal settlements which prevent any possibility of a contiguous state on the West Bank? Speaker, I'm following from the question from the honourable gentleman from um, Cheltenham, and whilst condemning the violence on both sides, I must say to the Foreign Secretary that the right to trade surely comes with the responsibility to uphold basic humanitarian principles. Yeah. Can I urge the Foreign Secretary to investigate the possibility of a consensus for economic sanctions within the European Union as an effective means of non-violent intervention delivering Israel to the negotiating table for the desperately needed two-state solution. Mr Crispin Blunt. When the Minister of State answered the urgent question two weeks ago following the dreadful murder of the three Israeli teenagers, the Palestinian children death toll due to the conflict had reached 1,406. On Saturday, it reached 1,430, including the uh, killing of four toddlers um, in the course of the last week. Uh, will the Foreign Secretary now say what he has implied. The Israeli action is disproportionate. Yeah. Yeah. To give us a bit more insight into the thinking of his, his Israeli counterparts, whilst we all accept the need for Israel to defend and deter, when he talks to the Israeli foreign minister, does he get any sense that it must be more difficult for Israel to defend and deter if they are holding an entire people in the largest prison camp in the world, in appalling conditions? Does he get any impression that common humanity calls out for peace and justice for the Palestinian people. Andrew Slaughter. Mr Speaker, we should not equate the occupied with the occupier. We should not equate a refugee population of 1.7 million imprisoned in a tiny strip of land with the prison guards. We should not equate terrorists firing rockets with a supposedly civilised state systematically killing women, children, elderly and disabled people. Will the Secretary of State accept that if his and other Western governments fail to discriminate between the actions of Hamas and Israel, hundreds of Palestinian civilians will continue to die and the annexation of Palestine by Israel will continue? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I agree with the Foreign Secretary that what is needed is a ceasefire to provide relief to the people of Gaza and to restart the peace process. But is not it too late? In all the 17 years I have been in this House, progress towards a two-state solution has been in reverse. Just last year, the UN predicted that potable water in Gaza would run out by 2016. The Palestinian uh, officials are reporting that the Israelis are targeting water and sewage supplies. And already before this latest attack, the people of Gaza were spending 30 pence out of every pound on safe drinking water. How are we going to make sure that they can live while we carry on this argument? Karen Buck. Mr. Speaker, with half of the population of Gaza aged under 18 locked in an open prison uh, in one of the most densely urban concentrations in the world, there was never any prospect that children would not be the disproportionate victims of this military uh, action. And now we see uh, tens of thousands of homes without electricity and a rapid deterioration of the humanitarian situation. What urgent representations can he make now to ensure that while we wait for the ceasefire, which will inevitably come, we do not see a further worsening of a catastrophic humanitarian situation? Cathy Jameson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Secretary has already acknowledged the importance of access to water and sanitation. Would he therefore say what assessment he's made of those reports that Israeli aircraft have been targeting water wells? And if they have, that that is a clear breach of international law. Sir Bob Russell. Will the Foreign Secretary confirm that the actions of the Israeli political and military leaders constitute war crimes? Barry Gardner. Thank you, sir. 
Israel's right to defend itself, of which the Foreign Secretary speaks, is not an unconstrained right. Yet Israel's response has been unconstrained. It has been disproportionate and wrong. Heavy bombing in a densely populated area of 100,000 civilians causing the death of 170 people, a third of them children, is not self-defence, it is barbarism. What leverage does the Foreign Secretary have, and will he now apply it to make the Israeli government reappraise this barbaric and unproductive strategy? Mr Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Secretary quite rightly has condemned the rocket attacks by Hamas. But does he understand that his unwillingness to condemn as disproportionate the current response by the Israeli government feeds into a view held by many of our constituents that the lives of Palestinians are not regarded equally with the lives uh, of Israelis in this conflict and does very little to put that additional pressure on the Israeli government to act in a proportionate way when it is under attack? Burn. Uh, Mr Speaker, the airstrikes, the commando raids and the rocket attacks have got to stop before any more children are killed. But can I press the Foreign Secretary on Resolution 1860, which of course Britain led back in 2009, which said that justice required sustained and regular flow of goods and people through crossings. Does the Foreign Secretary not agree that without progress restoring the normality of trade, jobs and growth, we risk trapping the Palestinian people into a cycle uh, not just of violence but of despair from which there is no escape? Yeah, Griffith. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, we understand the immediate need for ceasefire and for humanitarian aid, but we really must look at the underlying causes. With Gaza under siege and 60% of the West Bank now under direct military rule and a seemingly complete failure to halt the continuing um, expansion of the Israeli settlements. He's mentioned now how difficult it is to influence Israel about the treatment of Gaza, but these settlements are illegal in the West Bank, so surely more could be done there. Could he explain what more could be done to put pressure on Israel in order to deal with the way that Israel is behaving? and therefore forward, uh, bring forward the, the peace process. Mm -hmm.